I'm Oliver Gao, and I'm a associate professor with the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering. And also, I'm serving as the director of Cornell System Engineering Program. Today, uh, you know, we're very lucky to interview with Professor Natalie Mahawad. And actually, Professor Mahawad, and she's a professor with the School of Earth and Atmospheric Science here at Cornell. And she's also serving as the faculty director of the Atkins Center for a Sustainable Future at Cornell. So, you know, Natalie is an expert uh, in climate change, atmospheric modeling at multiple scales. And of course, today we are going to go to some of the details of her exciting research. Um, so, Natalie, do you want to say anything about yourself? <laughs> Ah, yeah, let's see. Well, I guess I, my um, training, my PhD training is in meteorology, and I tend to um, work with the big climate models and, mm -hmm. um, and also a synthesis of data. So that's kind of a summary of the, the tools I use, and I work on aerosol, climate, and biogeochemistry interactions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. So, uh, you know, it's, it, so today, uh, so, uh, Natalie, you're going to be talking in the Cornell Ezra System Seminar Series uh, talking about you know the system of view linking climate change and also humans and also land use change. I think that's really a very exciting and also very important research area. So speaking of this, you know, as an expert on climate change and also on Earth system modeling, what do you view as some key grand challenges uh, that we human society is facing today? Right, and that's really interesting. And um, well, I mean, I think climate change is one of those, and poverty and uh, maintenance of biodiversity. I think these are all really large challenges that we're we're facing. Um, so, uh, you know, in my talk today, I'm going to talk about the Earth system and and how you know you have to really think of it as a system, mm -hmm. or you miss some of the feedbacks. Um, and uh, then uh, kind of in the conclusion, I I'm going to talk about what, what can we do to, to solve uh -huh. these problems. And I always come back to kind of the systems framework that I actually think it has to be a, a system view. It can't just be one little piece mm -hmm. because we, we need to move to sustainable energy without a doubt. But we also need to work, you know, that's kind of a supply side solution. We also yeah. need to be working on the demand side. And, and you and I have talked a lot about this, that if you change the way um, human settlements are developed, mm -hmm. you can really reduce the, the impact on the environment. And um, you can modify behavior in ways that make the humans healthier, as well as the environment healthier. I mean, for example, getting people out of cars. You know, cars are extremely dirty yes. for the environment. Um, and if people are walking instead, if it's short, if it's a beautiful walk, they're, they're going to walk, and it makes them healthier. So these kind of um, infrastructure changes and changes in the way that we plan our, um, our settlements can really change the impact on the environment as, as well as humans. So uh, we've talked a lot about this, and um, I, I stuck a little bit in at the end about where I think you know, the systems approach is really going to be important for um, solving climate change. Yeah, I think, uh, Natalie, thank you. I think you mentioned the basic kind, you know, the, you know, the human factors and also the system. And I think, and now I realized, you know, whenever you have humans involved in something, and uh, it almost becomes necessary that we have to take a systems approach. Uh, right, for example, I think like in, in the abstract of your talk, you mentioned, of course, you know, uh, there is this Paris Agreement, right, where we, we did have some kind of ambitious goals and also uh, kind of initiatives we want to take. For, for example, we want to just, you know, reach only just two degrees of warming, right? So, however, one key point I think you mentioned is that all these things are voluntary. Yeah. Voluntary from, you know, from different countries. So, so what's your view about, because this voluntary will immediately have to do with humans and human groups and countries and governments. So what's your view about this you know, voluntary approach? And well, uh, you know, what is good and what is still lacking? Well, so I, would, I would take a step back. And yes. so from my perspective, I actually think the system approach is the way to think about the climate system, the Earth system. You can, you can hear it in the language already that you can't just focus on the atmosphere or the ocean. You have to think of the whole system and all the responses on different scales. So even yes. before humans <laughs> are there, I think it actually yeah. is a system. But that's probably more of a scientist approach, right? Because mm -hmm. we tend to study natural systems. Whereas engineers focus more on managed, human-managed systems. Um, I think the, um, 
even the Paris agreements, which are extremely aggressive and but voluntary, reaching those is, is going to be a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And it, um, it's going to require um, yeah, the buy-in of people and modifications to the existing way that we develop. And mm -hmm. there, there's already new technologies coming along. I mean, there's, there's a lot of positive things um, in terms of, say, the, the cost of solar panels, the cost of batteries, you know, all these kind of ways that we can move to uh, more sustainable energies. Um, but it, it's going to require people to have buy-in, okay? So yes. that, that requires um, uh, human decisions uh, for sure and buy-in in social science as well as business incentives. It, it has to make somebody money or, you know, it has to have some kind of policy structure that makes it so that people will want to do that, not, not just feel they have to do it but want to do it. Yes. But the, the Paris Agreement is, is completely insufficient, to be honest, to, to solve mm -hmm. the, the problem. And, and I'll talk about that, that it, it's really, um, it's very ambitious, it's a big success, but it's completely inadequate um, mm -hmm. to, to pro solve the problem of climate change. And um, so we need to be thinking about other things to do. And, and that's where I think even more of the systems approach is, is required and more fundamental changes in the way that we think about human settlements and infrastructure and you know, development. Yeah. Thank you, Natalie. And I think it's kind of also thank you for uh, you know, bringing me back uh, even before, you know, before, we kind of, you know, uh, before we kind of jump to the human parts. Uh, thank you for bringing me back to kind of even you know, the natural Right. system because I think in that that part if you don't have a very good understanding of the complexity and I have a very good grasp on that complexity of the natural systems and it's very hard for us to even think about introducing humans in right. the control and the change of this system and speaking of that actually and I, I noticed this one thing uh, where your research is actually addressing you know on both fronts you know on one hand you can see that we want to control climate change, uh, right? And so on the other hand, uh, there is also, uh, you know, for example, my research is on transportation, air pollution, and the public health. So from a health point of view, we're trying to work on air pollution. And of course, a lot of times, you know, for example, I'm thinking, okay, if we can reduce emissions, uh, for example, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and then we feel like, okay, it's not only going to improve air quality and protect public health, that will probably also help uh, the climate. But it doesn't seem to be the case always. For example, uh, now all over the world, uh, when we talk about public health, one of the key pollutants is PM, particulate matter, like PM 2.5, or uh, in the environmental research study, also we call aerosols, right? So in that case, I see that actually reduction of aerosols could actually hurt uh, you know, our goal of achieving climate change. So you can see that it's, this is a very nice example of the system complexity. So would you uh, mind to talk about how, from both research and policy point of view, how do we coordinate the air quality control goals versus the climate control goes. Yeah, well this is that's a really important policy question and it's a yeah. value question. So yeah. I'm not sure I can dictate <laughs> anything there. But um, but it is a, a really interesting dichotomy in, in some ways that um, the aerosols in the net, I mean black carbon probably warms, but you don't just emit black carbon, you always emit organic carbons and other things that mm -hmm. um, tend to cool the atmosphere. And then in addition the aerosols interact with clouds and tend to make clouds more reflective. So again it cools. That's and then right. what I'll talk about today, too, is um, the work in my group has really emphasized how aerosols actually fertilize the land and the ocean and make them so they take oh. up more CO2. So that's yet another mechanism that aerosols and air pollution have been um, actually, you know, solving or reducing our climate change problem. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't think... Anybody, you know, even people very concerned about climate would argue that we should not address the air quality issue. I mean, this is mm -hmm. killing people today. This is a huge issue. We, we, I would prioritize cleaning up air quality, mm -hmm. even if it makes the climate change problem worse. I see. Um, I mean, and the other thing about the air quality problem is um, you saw uh, 
last year, the year before, um, China's voluntary agreement to reduce c CO2. Mm -hmm. But I think that was actually probably more because if they reduce CO2, they're actually reduce their aerosols, and their aerosols are killing so many people. So they'll have such a net benefit mm -hmm. from reducing the air quality that they'll accidentally reduce their CO2, which will help them meet their climate targets, right? Mm -hmm. And so those, uh, you know, the air quality lever in, in places like China, where people are getting wealthier and don't want to breathe that nasty air, they really, they, they want to have, you know, a more first world life, which means you can go outside and breathe. Yeah. And um, so with that, the, the wealth, they're moving more towards um, air quality. Uh, reductions and that's going to make you know make a lot of sense economically and um, they will also accidentally help the climate change right so it's very interesting yeah. the interplay between air quality and climate I think it's a it's a um, pros and cons there I would say but I, I think air quality is, is very important and we have to make efforts towards reducing the air pollutants even if it causes the climate change problem to get worse I think that you know that's a very good point. So I think this is you know this interrelation between air quality and climate change. I think this is also a re very good uh, reflection of how complicated you know these kind of natural systems are. And uh, speaking of that, actually, you can see that you know if we increase this a little bit or how much, and that part will go up or go down by yeah. how much. Yeah. So I think kind of you know even as a layman, like to your research. When I hear you talking about this interdependency or this potential relation between air quality and climate change, I can get it immediately. So which means that the general public can get this kind of, oh, they are interrelated. However, you know, a general public's view of knowing that they are interrelated is probably not enough to direct or support the decision makers to come up with sensible kind of solutions. That's why actually where like you, you know, scientists in this area, you provide quantitative analytical support. You are not only telling people that this is going to go up, but also tell people exactly how much. Because in the end, a lot of decision making, right, they talk about like benefit cost ratio. And yeah. this needs to be quantified. So in doing these things, so how, how do you carry out this kind of research. I noticed that you mentioned, you know, you, you use, you know, kind of earth system models, uh, you know, that of course, you know, considering, consider all these different interactions, nonlinearities and complexities. But in the meantime, you also seem like you also use data, right? So, and then that kind of, you know, brings me to a general a kind of system question of what's your view, um, the function and the role of system models and the data. How do these two work together or even something else work together to help you address the research questions you have? For example, nowadays, you know, we have more advanced computational power and also we have sensor networks everywhere. We have huge data. So many people are talking about data science and big data. So where, how do you, you know, what tools do you use and how do you use them uh, so efficiently to to address these problems. Well, that that's such a good question. But that to me, that's kind of that's where the science is. That's where the hard part is. is yes. Taking off a piece of the problem, or you know, a particular process mm -hmm. that maybe you can you can use the model to figure out which process is important, which um, parameter is important, and then try to think about if if we have the data that can help you constrain mm -hmm. that that process or problem. So there's the. Um, uh, I don't know. I, I think that's one of the bigger questions in terms of trying to do science in, in, in environmental science, right? Where there's no control, right? We can't that's just go right. out there and turn off the CO2 or turn off the air quality. So how do we get those relationships? And, um, you know, you can use correlations. You can, you know, in the data, you can um, kind of, uh, hypothesize relationships and check them. Mm -hmm. And then you can also do the same thing in the model. So that, you know, these are the kind of things we try to do. And then... Um, I, I think the model is good for, for sticking hypothesis into the model. Like, mm -hmm. if this is important, then this should happen. And, um, and then see if that's what the model comes up with, or if indeed there's some other process that can actually hide that effect so mm -hmm. that you can't see it as well as you might think. Um, I just, um, in some of our work, for, for example, the, um, we're working on iron 
um, coming out of either deserts or combustion and it goes down um, wind and it becomes more soluble as it goes down wind. Mm -hmm. And um, we think that probably sulfate air pollution is actually helping it become solubilized. Well, if you look in the data, there's no correlation between the solubility of the iron and the sulfate. And so the data people would say, well, no, you know, it can't be that then. That's but right. But actually, if you, if you put in your model that the only way you can form soluble iron is from sulfate, and you look at the places that they were measuring, there's no correlation in the model either. And, and the reason is, is it's not just the sulfate, it's time that is working, right? And as you go farther I downstream, see. the sulfate had more content. So, so this is where models are, are really good at trying to help you understand if you can actually check your hypothesis with the data that way, mm -hmm. right? And of course, they're not perfect, but I think they're, they're great in combination with data. So that's the kind of things we try to do, is try to um, bring it down to a, a, a hypothesis we can test with the data. We use mm -hmm. the model to help refine it. We use the data to help inform the model, you know, and go back and forth. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's kind of my view of how to, how to do the science here. Yeah, you know, thank you, Nathan. I actually, like, I, I totally agree with you. This is really also, I think the example you just gave is also a very good uh, indication of how, you know, science advances. Yeah. Right. So kind of, you know, scientists, you know, we, we can we can only do what we have. By that, what I mean, kind of, you know, our mind could go, you know, way, you know, way advanced. However, when we build these models, you know, how do we calibrate models and how we validate models and how do we even use these calibrated models for prediction and forecast? So, you know, no models are perfect. Right, there are always kind of uh, weakness. However, that's where I think kind of the, you know, the, the great researchers is that they use very limited resources, including model data. However, by using modern data in a such a creative way, they shed lights on the new insights. Right. Where like in the previous researchers were not able uh, to discover. So I think it's, that's also, I think, it's kind of very good reflection of some kind of philosophic questions in system engineering, right? It's kind of, it's a, it's a compromise. However, this compromise is not a passive. It's more a kind of a creative compromise, but kind of you are more, more trying to reach out rather than, you know, meeting in the uh, middle ground. Right. So uh, speaking of this, I think there is this uh, very one good example I saw from your website like your work on aerosol biogeochemistry. Mm -hmm. right? In this part of the work, and you focus on understanding the interactions between anthropogenic and also natural aerosols, um, biogeochemistry in the current and also uh, the past climate. So, um, of course, uh, you know, now when we look back, when we look at climate change and when we look at, uh, look at the environment, we always blame that humans, since you appear on Earth, you messed so many things up. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, it's really the human and the natural environment kind of interaction. So in your aerosol biogeochemistry study, so, so what are the major findings or what are the major cautions or insights you would like to share with, with people? Well, that, that, I mean, that's the interesting thing here, right, is that the aerosols aren't just cooling um, because of reflecting the radiation, yeah. but they're also actually fertilizing the ocean. I mean, there's soluble iron that w we, can be, we can emit from combustion or that is emitted from deserts and is processed by air pollution mm -hmm. to become more soluble. It actually makes the oceans more productive. And oh. more ocean productivity means more fisheries, more... Um, uh, potentially more carbon uptake, and so in a way, it's actually a positive. Uh, you know, it, it fertilizes. Um, now, one might argue that uh, we shouldn't be messing with nature, so so that's bad. But mm -hmm. if we are messing with nature, which we are, um, then maybe it's not bad to have it to be a little more fertile. And the the other kind of interesting thing is um, that one of the things that climate change will do is stratify the ocean, and so make mm -hmm. it more difficult for nutrients to come up from below. And so if humans are accidentally at the same time putting in more nutrients from above, mm -hmm. you can offset a little bit of the stratification 
um, issue so that, again, these aerosols being deposited to the ocean are kind of offsetting what's going on from climate change to the ocean productivity. Wow. So there's some really interesting feedbacks there. Yeah, so it's not just, you know, air pollution is bad. I mean, air, uh -huh. air pollution has a, uh, a bunch of Im different impacts downwind that we hadn't really thought about before. So yeah. th that's kind of interesting to come across. Wow, this is this is really amazing. Like you know, when you talk about these examples, right? You you are talking about you know atmosphere, and you are talking about ocean productivity, yeah. And you are talking about you know this uh, also land use change, human. So how you know as a researcher, right? Of course, kind of as a researcher, sometimes for example, um, reminds me of like when we were you know assistant professors. Right, we say okay. Try to focus on an area, uh, right? Dig into into the depth, into the depths. However, now your work is such a good reflection of this systems approach, system thinking. You're talking about you know air, water, and the land. So, um, how did you develop uh, that knowledge base? Well, yeah. So th that's a really interesting question. Is how do you do? high quality, I hope, yes. interdisciplinary work. Yes. And so, I mean, the first thing is I, I started out in a slightly cross-disciplinary area for my postdoc mm -hmm. um, in, on dust because dust is, um, desert dust is generated in dry, unvegetated regions with strong winds. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and so you need to understand a little bit about what's going on in the land surface and the ecology in the land surface. And... Um, and then you look downstream, and it's important. It's important in the atmosphere, but that's atmospheric science. But then it's important yeah. in the ocean um, because of the iron that's in the dust um, fertilizing the ocean. And so then you have to care about the ocean. Um, and so some of it is I slowly expanded, right? Mm -hmm. So you know yeah. I've been doing this for 20 years. So you know at first it was just dust, then you know trying to get the soluble iron and things like that. But the other thing is, is I have really good colleagues who are more focused on the ecology mm -hmm. on land and more focused on the ocean ecology. So um, many of my papers have many co-authors, mm -hmm. especially if there's data, because I make sure that I bring in the data people as well to make sure we're not misusing their data. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of my papers will have a lot of co-authors because these different perspectives. I yes. want to work with the experts in their different areas. Mm -hmm. So um, I may pull together or participate in a cross-disciplinary effort, mm -hmm. but I make sure I have the best people on, yeah. on there. And so to me, that's the way to do really, really interesting, cool work. And that, that's actually what happened for my postdoc. So I saw this, you know, someone else constructed the group. Mm -hmm. And I came in and I was doing the work and working with all these different people. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, we, we just, the, the answer came out. You know, you, you have this right. problem, we need to explain this. And then you talk to everyone and you're like, oh, well, that's why. Oh, you know, and then the, the yes. paper kind of writes itself. So that I found that really exciting. And so I've kind of tried to recreate that with, um, more colleagues who work on these different issues. Uh, that's really very important, especially, I think, you know, for the education of system and engineering students. Yeah. Like uh, when we talk about system and a lot of time we refer to that T-shaped structure, right? And the T-shaped knowledge structure means that with this vertical line represents, for, like, for example, a student undergraduate major area where, yeah. you know, he or she has built some very good foundation. However, this you know this horizon bar where we want to equip yeah. these system engineer or system students so that they are not just digging into their own vertical line. They can through this you know, through this horizon line they can have capabilities to do exactly what you just said. No, I, so, I think that's a great model. Yeah. You have to have depth somewhere, yeah. but then the breadth to talk to other people. Yep. Yeah, I think yeah, th th that's, that's kind of very, very important. So I also noticed that, you know, of course, you mentioned models. And one model I think I, I collected from your research is this you know, community earth systems models. So um, if you don't mind, maybe here we can also you know, give people a sense about, you know, some more technical things of these kind of models, for example, Earth system models. What is that model and uh, uh, what can that model help us do? So um, the community Earth system model is the, yeah. one of the premier 
um, climate or earth system models, mm -hmm. now we call them, in the United States. So it's one of, say, three models in the United States that participate in the um, IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, so mm -hmm. on our future estimates. Um, the model is uh, now just the NSF funded. There, there used to be quite a bit of DOE funding also going into the model. Mm -hmm. And it has a center at, at the, the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, which mm -hmm. um, I uh, worked there and I've collaborated there ever since I started my um, PhD. So it's really a center of atmospheric sciences and mm -hmm. uh, of climate science. And um, that model is um, uh, kind of j jointly administered by a group of people. So I'm on the scientific steering committee, for example, for yeah. that, even though I'm at a university. And um, so a bunch of people make decisions about it. And one of its goals is actually for university users. So it's, it's really very outward looking. It's very NSF oriented, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It's That's where nice. Yeah. yeah, it's publicly available, all these things. But uh -huh. and yet the infrastructure at NCAR um, you know, to get the model running, make sure it's bit for bit, you know, repeatable, all these kind of infrastructure things are yeah. all taken care of at NCAR. Yeah. Um, so, you know, both, you have that balance of easy access and yet supported. So the, the, these kind of models are, um, well, they, I mean, they came out of, you could think of weather models. So, you know, in, in the uh, starting um, in uh, you know World War One, probably they started making um, weather predictions, very very simple weather predictions. But people realized how important it was to have good weather predictions for for, for war. So really, a lot of meteorology and weather prediction really comes out of military um, installations. For example, the Met Office in the UK is in their Department of Defense, mm -hmm. actually. So um, and um, and the meteorologist. Um, Everybody knows when the meteorologist is wrong, and they know soon. And mm -hmm. so meteorologists have a very strong tendency to, to fix things and improve things. And so um, the, the models are always evaluated with skill. And so those very same models that are used for meteorological predictions mm -hmm. in, in the atmosphere are basically moved over to work on climate. And the, there are some differences. For, for climate, you have to make sure you have the energy balance exact okay you can't uh -huh. lose any mass you can't lose any energy because yeah. you're going to run it for thousands of years and that doesn't matter for weather prediction weather prediction is is a short term i see that the other difference between weather and climate is um, weather is an initial value problem and climate is a boundary value problem mm -hmm. okay and that means that um the um, you know that weather forecasts don't always aren't always right mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that has to do with the initial value that the observations aren't perfect and so then when you move forward, y you get an error. You know, the butterfly in the tropics can cause a hurricane elsewhere because these are chaotic systems. Um, for climate, you're interested in a 30-year average. So it's really, it's a boundary value problem. So it's the change in the fluxes on the ed edges. So in a lot of ways, it's an easier problem um, because you, uh, you don't care if you get the weather right on a particular day, which is so hard. Uh -huh. um, on the other hand, um, there's a lot of uncertainties in the climate system and in the, um, and in the energy budget, and especially with the clouds. Mm -hmm. And so there's uncertainties also in climate. So these models, um, the, the ones we work with, uh, you know, started out with an atmosphere, then a land surface and an ocean were added, and now they even have a land ice element, so that the simulation of the ice sheets and, for example, Greenland or Antarctica can, can be done so we can understand maybe the rates at which they might be uh, accumulating mass or losing mass. Uh -huh. so, um, sea ice is in these models now, all these types of things that are so important for the climate system. And so, you know, at, at one time step, they, there's millions of grid boxes globally in the atmosphere, millions in the, um, in the ocean. Um, the, the land as well is actually three-dimensional. It goes down into the soil. So, mm -hmm. you know, millions and millions of grid boxes. And then you use a prognostic differential equation to time step forward, maybe a half hour time step um, and with on super, you know, these supercomputers. And then you can start doing long time series, so even thousand year runs with the computers then that are, you know, NSF computers usually, or um, it, like I said, um, NSF used to be in a partnership with DOE on these, so the DOE has really nice computers. There. This is really great because you can see that, you know, by, know, now, by knowing the further depths of the model and now we appreciate how, uh, how complicated the processes are and how the scientists through generations of effort. Yeah. Right. And they, they you know, build block by block 
and build these models. Right. That kind of um, you know kind of made me think. Uh, you talk about Unkar, right? You know the center, and uh, now you know myself. I'm also directing the center, but I realized a center. Uh, it's not really just simply okay. You have these people together for a period of time, and the center is more of an academic or a scientific ecosystem. Yeah, that yeah. needs accumulation, yeah. right? You know, Ungar has been there like you know ever since your PhD study, and now your career is still you know so far, and you know you can see that this you are still affiliated, right? Intellectually, you feel attached. Yes. Right. You know, and also the center is also attached to you. Right. And I think this is such a, a healthy, uh, you know, ecosystem for scientific research community. So you know, we, now we talk about the scientific and the technical details of the models. So now, if we can jump back a little bit to uh, something, especially because you are looking at things at multiple scales, at the regional and also at the lo uh, global scale. Like one of your research is about the transport, the animal space transport. Uh, this reminds me of you know, I was reading news. Uh, sometimes they will say, okay, you know, they, they say that, okay, California, some of the aerosols in California, uh, you know, came from China. And the Chinese say, you know, some of the things, you know, came from another upwind yeah. uh, area, you know, this kind of transport. So that will involve countries and, of course, humans. So these natural processes and the human related management. Uh, structures. So now, assuming that we have very good understanding of the technical complexity, we have all these models uh, that are able to account for, give, give a, a very exact like social cost or source inventory accounting, where they come from. So with this kind, you know, supported by these kind of transport models, how now if we go towards the management aspect, uh, how these models can help better support the management schemes and mechanisms that all these stakeholders, they say, oh, wow, yeah, Professor Mahaud showed me all these things. Now I feel, now I feel, I realize this is my fair share mm -hmm. I need to take up. So how now these models are going to be connected to uh, management? Right. Well, that's a, that's a really interesting question, and especially on um, the intercontinental transport of air pollutants. Yeah. The, there's several groups working on that and, and trying to resolve those issues. I'm, I'm not so active in that area. I don't I don't work on that especially, mm -hmm. but I know a little bit about it. And and that's really what they're trying to do is is you know say well this is how much is coming over and how you know this is what Europe is doing to um, Asia and this is what Asia is doing to the U.S. and this is what the U.S. is doing to Europe and, uh -huh. and look at that and, and you know specifically studies that would suggest say in the U.S. you know if we tried to get um, all our cities in compliance with the national ambient air quality standards some of the time they're going to be out of compliance because of emissions in China it mm -hmm. actually matters to us some, some of the time um, but it also matters um, to us some of the, you know, the dynamics in, internal to the, the pollutants here. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the, we, we think of pollutants mostly anthropogenic, right? But there are some um, that are emitted by natural sources, you know, wildfires mm -hmm. or, you know, even trees emit um, some volatile organic compounds. And those interact with pollutants that humans are emitting and cause trouble. So, so the, the human natural system, even within the U.S., makes mm -hmm. it sometimes difficult to, to manage the system, to get the, the standards in, um, uh, to be met. So um, there's, a, there's a lot of interesting ways to, to, to um, look at the problem, and I, I do think models help in trying to um, attribute the causes and then look what management will work, mm -hmm. but then sometimes they fail and, and um, uh, you know, the management doesn't succeed in reducing the air quality as much as people thought, for example, or improving the air quality as much as people thought. Um, and then we learn something scientifically about, oh, there was this other kind of buffering process that mm -hmm. was going on. So, so again, it's kind of a two-way street there also because we don't understand everything, but I think models are a really good tool for regulatory action. Yeah, that's right. Especially, I think models are because when you talk about regulatory action, we're talking about the future. Yeah. Right. In the future, you you don't have the data. Yeah. 
what can you use? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you can just run hypotheses. What, what do we think will happen if we do this, this, and this? If this is the mechanism that's dominating, you know, the production of that. Airplane. That's right. Yeah, yeah that's right. Uh, you know, uh, speaking of this, actually, I would like to you know bring up this thing that I, when I was reading this uh, in the Cornell Chronicle, I was feeling so proud. I can be a colleague with you. Oh. <laughs> and I think can you kind of uh, you know. Uh, out of like kind of 560 uh, you know nominations from all over the world, and uh, you were one of those uh, 86 experts from 39 countries selected to help UN United Nations uh, to help frame the UN report, the next report for global warming. Uh, you know, I read this from uh, probably I think uh, in March uh -huh. 2017. Like you were. One, uh, you have been selected. Uh, you have been selected to be one of those eighty-six experts. Yeah, like, that was uh, super competitive. Apparently. Yeah, that's you know that, that's why you know I think that made me so proud <laughs> to yeah. be a colleague oh, well. with you. So, so with this, so uh, what you know, what's on your mind? Um, because I, I feel you know this, you know this report, you know, because I think a lot of time actually in framing something, it's so fundamental that even just doing something. Well, right. yeah, it, uh, does, does it really say frame? Because we, yeah. um, we were writing the report, so I yeah. wasn't on the scoping meeting, um, but on the, the, um, also the, writing, the writing report. Yeah, so so there's a lead, I'm a lead author on this special report on um, achieving 1.5 degrees of warming um, in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals, achieving the Sustainable Development Goals and eradicating poverty. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yes. Which is a lot of things all at once. Yeah. Talk about a system. So I'll talk a little bit about that also in the talk today. Um, and it, it's a really, really interesting um, group of people because um, normally in the IPCC process, people are, um, are kind of separated into the working group. So uh, I'm a working group one kind of person. I work on the physical science of mm -hmm. climate change. Um, and the working group, two people are impacts, vulnerabilities, adaptations. There's more social scientists, ecologists, those, um, those kind of things. And then the, the third working group is mitigation. And so that then is engineers and economists. Okay, so, you, so people are kind of segregated a little bit uh -huh. normally in the IPCC process. Yeah, which is not a systems approach. <laughs> exactly. But this report has all three working groups. So, um, and there, were, there was a previous report that had, well, two working groups, but um, the special report on extremes was working group one and two. But this one has all three. And uh, it's, it's very interesting. In, um, I mean, you know, because you, you do interdisciplinary mm -hmm. work also that, yeah. um, Every time you, you try to work with a new group of people or a new area, that y you have to get your language right because mm -hmm. people mean a different thing when they say, you know, mitigation actually has many different meanings. You have to say exactly what kind of mitigation you mean. Um, uh, and um, even, even within the IPCC, the uncertainty is defined differently across different working groups. You know, it's just all these cultural things mm -hmm. that you really have to talk to, to people about. And, and this report is also very interesting because um, reaching 1.5 is uh, extremely ambitious, if not impossible. Okay, mm -hmm. it's really a very, very difficult thing to achieve. And achieving the sustainable development goals is also extremely hard, if not impossible, as well as eradicating poverty, which mm -hmm. is actually all those things are sustainable development goals if you frame it that way. Um, and you know, how how do you, how do you talk about something um, without being policy prescri prescriptive? Because we're not we're not policymakers. Mm -hmm. um, we're scientists, and and yet really lay out what the options are fairly. Okay, that's and, right. And talk about what you know what a difficult problem it is, and 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 elsewise. It's um, the uh, I I always learn a lot um, with within these IPCC processes. So this one is is really really difficult. We're right in the midst of the whole process right now so I, you know I can't talk about any of the the results from it because it's all confidential mm -hmm. um, but it's um, we're examining a lot of really hard issues and, and yeah. it's very interesting I know that a lot of things are you know are still um, you know ongoing work right so uh, for the report and uh, you are writing on the report uh, I just kind of you know when I'm thinking about this like look at the exciting research you just shared with us the advancement from models to data collection and even to uh, the education of future working force. I think we are, we are doing quite well, especially in you know, these models, these technologies that made me uh, really feeling optimistic about our future of controlling you know, uh, climate change. So this is come more from a scientific, technological, 
advancement point of view that made me feel optimistic. And then when I think about the other side of implementing and managing, you know, those aspects, when those aspects that comes uh, to relate to humans and the stakeholders. And you know, you know we, we don't have any, you know, we're scientists, we're engineers, we don't have any political agenda at all. However, you know, when I look at the human side, that somehow makes me feel less optimistic uh, compared to what I got from looking at the scientific and the technology aspect. So what's your way and how do you think we should uh, approach this? Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm also um, with you on, I, I, you know, I feel like I'm mostly a scientist in this. I'm not a, a policymaker, um, and um, I'm mostly here just to present the options. That's right. And um, it's, th there's a lot of choices, but they're hard choices. They really are. I mean, we know that mitigation will cost money. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe that money is better spent, you know, either growing our economy, or adapting, or um, trying to bring people out of poverty. You know, I mean, there, there's only so much money, you know, and how do we optimize all these goals that we have? Um, you know, and we have to spend a certain amount on research and development. What areas do we prioritize? I mean, these are, these are really, really hard questions. So, yeah, um, I, yeah I, I think uh, we're, it'll be a very interesting next 20 years. Let's just put it that way. I uh -huh. think that, that we're going to experience here as academics in, and uh, trying to resolve some of these big problems that we have, uh, you know, in the environment, in um, development and sustainable development and, you know, maintaining kind of in the first world the, mm -hmm. the affluence that we have, right, to, to kind of run a lot of these things. I, uh, it'll be really interesting. So. And of course, you know, as researchers, I think one thing kind of we we discover one problem, we try to find an answer, and we find that answer, and we t we keep digging, digging, digging. We want to dig into what is the most fundamental thing that affects something, yeah. right? That's basically you know scientific research. And I think you know uh, you and me where we have been both uh, concerned about sensibility, and like in my research, I have always always thinking about okay. You know, there is this non-linearity, there is a complexity. Okay, we better, on, we get better understand this and what is behind even more fundamental things. A lot of time when I think about this, in the end, when I think about the key challenge of sensibility, that, you know, it seemed like, you know, my thoughts drove me to an idea that I think is really the human nature, human behavior. Which means that, for example, probably a lot of research we are going to draw a conclusion that you know the way we are living, the way we are spending our natural resources today, is not a sustainable way. Yeah. So the solution we tell people is that you need to change your behavior. Yeah. You need to change your lifestyle. Yeah. But how? Yeah. How do we change uh, yeah. the behavior and life? You know the lifestyle, and then that actually kind of I, I don't have any intention of saying that how important education is. However, when we talk about changing human behavior and changing human lifestyle, and I feel, I feel like one of the fundamental solutions actually lies in education. Uh, that, that could very well be. Um, I don't know. I think it's very, I think there's so much inertia in social interactions. You get on one path, it's hard to move, but, um, I don't know. I guess I, I am optimistic um, that maybe we can try to develop pathways that are a little more sustainable than the one we've been on. So yeah, you know, especially like kind of you know, if we look at, I think probably you and me we joined Cornell probably the same time, like in two thousand five, around that time. So I notice like now among the students, what I observe uh, now, even in the Cornell, all over the campus, I think we have a very strong culture. Uh, for sustainability, yeah, uh, right. I think can, if you look at even within the college engineering, I see because you know students are admitted without of the very specific affiliation with the major. However, like you know, even when we advise student projects or when we have student affiliation, uh, when we talk to students, I feel like there is a stronger increase in interest among our students who are genuinely interested. Uh, in education, 
So speaking of that, I think kind of we're getting towards the end of our conversation. Uh, so what's your view about you know, your, your research and your teaching element of your academic life? And also, where do you see all these things driving towards in the future? Yeah, well, that's an interesting question. I mean, so um, uh, I, I was previously actually at National Center for Atmospheric Research, and there I didn't have to teach. I, I was only do research, which... Uh -huh. You know, many people would love to have, but to me it wasn't um, it wasn't fulfilling enough. I really enjoy working with students, so I came here um, to take on students, really. Mm -hmm. And um, so I love to teach, and I love to interact with students. And um, what we've tried to do is um, build more curriculum on climate change, for example. And really, uh, a lot of it is the systems approach. And uh -huh. you know, you you talk about a problem, and then you have people come in from all different perspectives on that problem. And I think that the cross disciplinary aspects of um, uh, climate change or different climate solutions is, is what I love to, to teach about. And that's always yeah. in collaboration with other people. But yeah. yeah. Um, and so to me, that's uh, the, the great part about being in a university, because the, the student asks such good questions. And, and then if I'm teaching a class that's cross-disciplinary, I learn too, because <laughs> I have my colleagues come in and teach me things. Yeah, you know, I was looking at your recent publication. Probably, you know, you probably talk about it in your uh, in your talk. But I was really excited about the interactions between land use change and carbon cycle feedbacks. You know, I think this is really a very nice system integration system approach. Look at all these different complicated elements together. Uh, you know, that's a very nice publication. And also, I'm just curious. So, from that paper, from that research. Uh, you know, you 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 employed advanced models and using uh, probably you know a lot of data from different sources. Um, but in the end, so uh, you, know, you have the conclusion, and also I believe that has very important implications for policy as well as for practice. So, so now, so what's your what's your conclusion? What would you talk? What would you tell? like me, like a general public, about interaction between land use and the carbon cycle. And me, right. as an individual, what should I do in the future? Right, well, <laughs> and, and we have another paper that's coming out just right now, it's, it's online, um, talking about the same topic on a shorter time scale. Mm -hmm. But um, sometimes um, I think people have put um, deforestation and land use in opposition to climate change. For, mm -hmm. for example, um, that, that climate change is that um, it is driven by energy, and um, and we can move off fossil fuels and mm -hmm. use more land, and so then it puts you know biodiversity uh, in opposition to, to climate change. Mm -hmm. And what we've shown in, in a series in a series of paper is you know it largely known already, but I think not articulated so clearly is that right now about forty percent of climate change is from land use and agriculture. Um, so deforestation and agriculture and pasture mm -hmm. usage. So 60% is from energy. And in the future, of course, the, the energy could very well um, increase um, mm -hmm. and be you know, 90 or 100% of it um, out at 2100 or 2200. Um, but, um, but if we try to go for low targets of climate change, if we reduce our sustainable energy, we still need to deal with the deforestation and, and agriculture. And um, if the way that we try to solve um, climate change is by moving to bioenergy, for example, that's going to take up a huge amounts of land mm -hmm. and either compete with food or compete with natural lands. And, um, and so this is where this opposition has come in, where people think the solution to climate change is more land use and more deforestation, which will impact biodiversity. And what we argue, um, and other people have argued this in a different way also, is that the conversion to bioenergy could be so bad for the um, for the climate that you wouldn't want to do it? That it's mm -hmm. it, that it actually has a, a lot of impacts on climate change that people haven't been paying attention to, because people are only thinking about it in terms of the CO2 directly removed when you remove the forest. And it turns out in that paper we were talking about how. Um, the, the, in addition to what you directly remove from the forest right now, you also lose carbon um, 
uh, later on that would have been taken up. So there's a lost sink of carbon because natural lands are acting as big carbon sinks right now as you mm -hmm. emit a lot of CO2. So, um, and in addition, agriculture emits a lot of um, greenhouse gases and uh, methane and nitrous oxide. So, um, so it's a little more complicated and, um, and probably conserving natural lands is better for climate change and of course it's better for biodiversity so that these things are actually, um, there's more co-benefits than, um, you know, they're not in opposition to each other. So that's kind of what the, the last series of, of articles we've written yeah. has talked about. You talk about, you know, this kind of, you know, agriculture deforestation, uh, defore deforestation and how that impact climate change. So we talk about this and then how about urbanization? Yeah. Because now, you know, develop so, so many developing countries like India, China, Brazil, they're urbanizing the population uh, there. Of course, you know, urbanization means more infrastructure investment, uh, right? Means like a kind of very good economic development engine, right? However, now from your point of view, uh, in, from a large, larger time scale. So what has urbanization done? Or what will it do? Yeah, so I haven't worked on that myself. So, and I, but I think it's a really interesting problem. Um, you know, right now, anyway, a lot more land is in agriculture and pasture usage than urban or suburban. I mean, suburban is huge yeah. also. Um, but it, it's very interesting because the urban areas and the suburban areas are going on to the best agricultural lands often, okay? Yes. And, um, and so then the urban and the agricultural lands are actually a little bit in, in competition too. So um, I think that that is a really, really good question, but I don't know the answer to it, and I don't know if somebody else knows the answer. Yeah. yeah. Oh, maybe I, I believe in the people in the future. Uh, that'll uh, be a good question yeah, for them. Yeah, you know, we'll keep just searching. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Natalie. Yeah, thanks yeah. for having me.